everybody. Thank you for coming over here at Collision 2019. And I'm here with Dr. Frank Munns. He's actually going to talk to us about service meshes. So Frank, take it away. Thank you, Alejandra. Can you all hear me? Yeah, fantastic. Great. So welcome. Good morning. Um, cool you made it to this presentation. It's actually a very technical presentation. I think that this, this doesn't make any sense to have a non-technical presentation about service meshes. So it is technical. Um, I try to make it as easy as possible. So there is an easy, gentle start, but I'm going to put many things together, so please pay attention. It gets increasingly difficult during the talk, but um, I think we're all going to make it. So my name is Frank Munz. I work uh, for the German-speaking countries, uh, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, as a technical evangelist. And um, the talk is about service meshes, and we dive deep into technology right now. So the first question is, if you do a modern microservices architecture, what components would you use? And feel free to, to shout. Anything that comes to your mind? EC2, you say? Yeah, yeah. So EC2 is, is, is one uh, solution. How about something more lightweight, how we deploy? Lambda, Lambda is a good point. Anything else? EKS, cool. Um, what is EKS based on what you run in EKS? Yeah, Docker containers. So I, I, we, we got the points already. So I wanted to list the building blocks, first of all, that we use. And the first one I highlighted in, it's actually orange. I'm not sure if it's, oh, it shows uh, yellow here. But it's orange containers. That's the most important part for this presentation, so containers. Then the second one, I, you mentioned it, serverless, AWS, Lambda. Um, higher abstraction layer, easier to build with a few more limitations. So containers are more general. Lambdas uh, bring you this higher abstraction layer that make it so popular now. And then one point you didn't mention is we have 165 services in the AWS universe. Um, and you can use any of them to build your application. And very often we have this discussion about people know about Docker containers. They know about what you mentioned about EKS. And then the question comes up, should you run your, let's say, MySQL database in a Docker container yourself or not? And people come and ask me. And the, question, the answer typically is, if it's a small scale problem and if you, if you know what you're doing, there's no reason why you should not do that. If you're trying to build something that is working across different regions in the world, so let's say from Sydney to Sao Paulo, and maybe across different availability zones, and uh, you want it highly available, and you plan for like 64 terabyte of, of, of memory for the database, um, then I would recommend you not to try this yourself. So if there is a cloud service available, use the cloud service now, and then your problems are solved. And that's an important thing to remember now. There is always this option of using cloud services. If there is a cloud service, that's the best solution now. So we have containers, we have serverless, we have um, all the other cloud services, and something which is the most fundamental is EC2. It's still around, we will have it for a while, and a lot of people still use it today. And it's actually your job as an architect to take this decision and to select the best possible solution. And don't trust the people that tell you everything is be serverless, that's not true. There will be containers, and also don't trust the people like they tell you everything will be containers, because there is a space for serverless, and there is even a space for EC2. And that's an important decision you have to take. No, there is no rule of thumb. It depends on your use case, it depends on your situation, it depends on quite a lot of factors. Now, containers are highlighted. I want to focus on containers. And containers help us a lot. No? They help us to get from development to production. They also help us to get from on-premises to the cloud because it's this fantastic packaging unit. But they also bring some new challenges. So we have challenges if we have containers at scale. And one thing is super easy, like starting a lot of containers. And, and I pled guilty. I did this many times in presentations like here. You do a for loop. And even on my small laptop, I can start you like 300 containers. And then you tell people, look, it scales. Um, 
and it's like very convincing now. But that's not the whole story. I mean, it's, it's more difficult to run containers in production. One reason is they're transient. They come and go, and it's, it's sometimes quite hard to keep track of them and to see what they're doing. You need to monitor them. You want their log files. Um, the other thing is starting 100 or 300 on my little laptop is easy, and it kind of shows that it's a, it's a very interesting technology you know, that works on a small scale on a laptop, but it also works on a hyperscale for companies like Amazon and Google, and they all, they all use containers. Um, so that's, that's convincing. But running 300 containers on a laptop is one thing. In production, the question will be different. The question will be, if you have 1,000 containers running already, and you need to start three more. How do you start them across availability zones and hook them up to a load balancer? So this question is different. And then the other thing that we tend to forget these days, because those containers seem to be so convenient, is that those containers, they're not virtualization. No. For some people, they still look like a virtual image, but they're not. No, it's just a little bit of Linux tricks with the C names, uh, with the C groups and namespaces that make it look like virtualized, but it's just isolated. So it's processes running on a host Linux system. And you have to ask the question, what happens if this host Linux system goes down, or the CPU goes into flames, or if it needs to be patched, and you need to move those containers um, to, other, to another host, and so on. So there's a lot of questions that um, basically have an answer. And the answer is you need more tooling. So the first story we told you like uh, five, six years ago is go for containers. And then in the, in the coming two years, we learned like containers is not good enough. You need something more that is an orchestration layer. And so we have tooling. We need tooling, like an orchestration layer. And um, the orchestration layer that is most suitable, that is the easiest to get started with in the AWS services world is ECS. It's the Elastic Container Service. And it's the easiest to get started with because it brings a nice integration with the whole entire AWS platform. It also scales almost unlimited. So we have very, very large clusters running on ECS these days. And the last point is you get service integration at the container level. So if you start today and you have no other requirements, the first thing you should look at is using ECS for running your containers. So that's maybe the kind of rule of thumb. So this could be the end of the talk regarding containers and orchestration. Um, but then something else happened like uh, a few years ago, three years ago, four years ago, depending on when you think this Kubernetes thing became mature. But like a few years ago, developers told us, look, we want to use Kubernetes. There's this open source orchestration um, framework, Kubernetes, and we want to use it. So imagine this, we had, as a company, we had ECS as a service running, and uh, thousands of customers use it very successfully. And then the input is, yeah, but we want to use the open source. And of course, we carefully listened to customers. Actually, like over 90% of our, of our roadmap is driven by customer feedback, by customer um, requirements. So we thought about this idea of you know, offering Kubernetes um, as well for customers. Now, so, some customers, they, uh, they ran Kubernetes on EC2, which is possible. But the learning was it's super hard to do it yourself. So I tried once myself. It was like two years ago for Christmas. Um, I bought like four Raspberry Pis, and I put them together to a cluster. And I have a quite good Docker background, and I know about distributed systems. And I thought, I'm going to run on this mini cluster. I'm going to run Kubernetes for myself just to explore it a little bit. And I terribly failed. No, I was, it was like so hard to get it up and running. It's not that you take the newest version of Kubernetes and install the newest version of Docker, because no, Kubernetes has some opinion what version of Docker it works with. And if you don't know all this, if you don't have this operational knowledge, it's like super hard to get this up and running. A colleague of mine who's a very experienced um, Kubernetes administrator, he always says, Kubernetes has the potential that it brings grown-up men to cry. You know? um, I think it's not that bad. But what I'm trying to say is, if you want to do it yourself, you have to have this operational knowledge. And you have to have enough people to run this 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And you should have somebody that you can call at you know, Saturday night at 3 o'clock if things go wrong and it's not working with a simple, uh, simple restart. So there are challenges. 
and because there are those challenges very often, our customers say, can't you run Kubernetes for us, you know? Can you not do the operational thing? And we just, you know, we want to use the standard tools and, and run our containers. And this is why we built EKS. It's the managed service for running Kubernetes. And it's actually, it's open source Kubernetes. And what we do is we provide the backplane, which is the difficult part. In the backplane, there is um, this etcd process that contains the state of whatever you do with, with Kubernetes, the configuration state. And this configuration state, of course, it's state. It has to be highly available. So it needs to be replicated. So we replicate this etcd process. We give it provisioned IOPS so it's fast enough. Um, we back it up regularly. So we, we create snapshots. If something goes wrong, we, re we restore those snapshots. Um, so we do all the hard work, basically, for you. And what you get is, not sure if we see this here. What you get here is this uh, DNS name that you connect to. And you bring the worker nodes that you see here on the, on the bottom layer. And you distribute them across the availability zones. Now, the good news is the worker nodes, they can be any kind of, of EC2 worker nodes. You can use spot instances. That makes it very cheap. You save like 80% of the cost. You can put them in auto-scaling groups. You can have worker nodes that use GPUs. Uh, some people say, why would you use GPUs for Kubernetes? Um, the, the answer is a lot of people are doing machine learning these days on Kubernetes. So it makes sense to have worker nodes even with GPUs. And then you connect your worker nodes to the, to the managed endpoint. And what you can do is use the standard tools like the kubectl or whatever tools um, you want to use, which is important for customers. So they tell us, don't change it. Don't put bells and whistles that make it incompatible. Just pro give us managed open source Kubernetes, and that is, this is what we are trying to do uh, with this. So now, things are getting more interesting. Now the question is, if we have Kubernetes, and it, it kind of solves the question how we abstract a number of computers and just have the kubectl command line, and we say, you know, kubectl apply, and we deploy a new pod with a new application, why do we still need a service mesh? And shouldn't this be a part of Kubernetes? And this is what I'm trying to explain in the main part of this, uh, of this presentation. And to better explain this, I want to talk, I want to take you a little bit back in history, like 10 years back in history. Uh, who was already around in IT like 10 years ago? That's, wow, that's cool. I always thought it's not a fair political correct question, but I, I was around. And 10 years ago, Honestly, I did a lot of these service bus projects or ESB projects um, where the core idea is we had services, we had backend systems, and those backend systems, they were kind of monolithic now. They were like big systems written in Java Enterprise Edition or written in some other language. Or it could be an SAP system with an API, and we had to connect them. Now, if you need to connect your systems and you, make to, you need to make these services talk to each other, what do you do? There is two ways to do it. One is you just connect them, and you have this point-to-point -point connections, which is not good now, because you have a squared number of connections. And always squared in complexity is like super bad in IT. You should never do this if you can avoid it. So instead of connecting them directly, what we did is we put this ESB layer in the middle. And it's a, it's a service bus. It's called Enterprise Service Bus. And the trick is, once you introduce the service bus, your squared number of connections goes down to a linear number of connections. If you count the services here, you will see like n services, and there is just n connections to the ESB. So this ESB is helpful, and the ESB is also helpful because the ESB exposes the API from a service, and you talk to the API on the ESB, and the ESB is forwarding the request to the real service. So the ESB is working like a proxy. You talk to the ESB, and the ESB is proxying or forwarding the request to the real service. That's the function of the ESB. And the benefit of using this is if all your calls go through the ESB, guess what? The ESB is a super cool point to collect metrics for monitoring. The ESB is also an interesting point where you can say, if I get a request, based on the header, based on the payload, based on some condition, it could be the day of the week, you decide to route the request to a service version A1 or to a service version A2. So you could do some versioning or even traffic shaping 
with this ESP. The other benefit from the ESP is the ESP is working on a, on a network layer. It doesn't really care if your service is implemented in Scala or Go or Rust or Java or Python or whatever. So it was a very versatile thing. The drawback of this ESP approach was it's a big monolithic thing. And then what happened in the next coming years is those monolithic endpoints, they were kind of um, replaced by microservices. So instead of one monolithic endpoint, you had like dozens or maybe a hundred microservices. And the question is, is it still a good thing to have this big monolithic ESP in the middle and hundreds of microservices as endpoints? And the answer is, well, just because it's monolithic doesn't make it really bad, but there is more issues to it. Like, typically such an ESB is configuration driven. That means if you change something, you don't have to restart it. You just change the configuration, and it's applied immediately. And this is mostly working. Trust me, I was doing projects, and it's mostly working. Now, if you talk to ops people and you tell them it's mostly working, what will they do? Well, they will tell you, well, if it's mostly working in production, then I will restart it every single time because I, don't, can, I cannot count with mostly working now. So they restarted this ESB every single time. Now imagine you change your microservices, you change the configuration, and every time you restart the ESB, that's not a good solution now. If you have hundreds of microservices, this actually gets much worse than having a few monolithic endpoints. So there's a big question mark if this ESB should be continued to use for microservices um, architecture today. And then like going advancing five years or going back five years, we had another solution. And this came from the Netflix people. Um, it's called Open Source Software Center. It's a bunch of libraries that implemented patterns, like similar patterns that try to improve the quality of the communication. Uh, they try to deal with what I like to call cross-cutting concerns because they're not really business logic, it's more, um, it's more how those services communicate. And one of those libraries um, is the library called Histrix, which implemented a um, circuit, circuit breaker pattern. And so the idea is that all of a sudden what was in the ESP in the middle now goes to the microservice and is part of the microservice. This advantage is if you need to use this, this library from the OSSC project, is if you use a library in a programming language, you know what you do. You need to import a library, and then you need to make your code use the functions in the library. So you change your code. Now imagine this for a minute. Somebody tells you, we go to the cloud, we take, um, we take this approach, and then we change the software to make it run in the cloud. Is this what you expect from running software in the cloud? The answer is, for most people, not really, no. So it, it's nice to have those libraries, but then you have them for one programming language only. And then the other thing is, is this really the way to, to, to migrate software to the cloud? And the answer is, it's not a perfect way because you need to change the source code. So the real question is, and you see there is some white space on the, on the right-hand side, is couldn't we take the best of both worlds now? Couldn't we have something that is language independent, that is um, decentralized, um, that is small scale and working for microservices? And the answer is, oh, guess what? That's the service mesh. So this service mesh approach, we kind of take the logic and put the logic in front of the microservice, but not into the microservice. And that's the important thing. We have this logic running in a proxy. Now, you see a lot of proxies running, and I will address this, this question, like, does it really make sense to have so many proxies running. But the po important thing is we have those proxies, we have the microservices, and all this is running in containers. All this is running, for example, on top of Kubernetes. That's why I gave you this introduction to ECS and containers and Kubernetes. Um, it's decentral, language agnostic, works for any language, and it's lightweight. So there's no problem of restarting a big monolithic layer in the middle. So it's, not, it's, it's, it's a very good approach, actually. And now we need to talk about how do you get to those proxies and how does this relate to all the other AWS services that you already know. Now, you know, in all programming languages, we have this hello world example. And if you're a developer, you've seen like dozens of hello worlds. Now we have hello worlds for Java. We have hello worlds for big data where we count words. And we have hello worlds for machine learning where we train dogs and cats and 
here we have the dog that is sleeping now. And the hello world for this service mesh example is a book info example. And you see it's polyglot. So we have Java here. And we actually have a site that is doing a product page for books. It's written in Python. Uh, we have reviews, which are written in Java. Those reviews come with different versions, version 1, 2, 3. And we have a Ruby part, which is giving you details. Um, and then there's a the back end, creating the ratings with Node.js. And if we take this demo application and we look at it from a more, more architectural view, you will see that there is two big boxes on the left hand, on the right hand side, and those are the pods in Kubernetes. So Kubernetes pod is like the, the smallest deployment unit that we have. Typically, you have a container running in a pod, but you can also have more than one containers running in a pod. So the pod is the, the, the surrounding entity for running a container. It comes with an IP address, but the IP address is not stable. So typically, in Kubernetes, we also create a service. But let's talk about this pod. The interesting thing is, in this pod, where we have the product page running uh, here, we also have the proxy running. And then the communication from the product page to the reviews is through the proxy, through the proxy on the other side, and then to the reviews. So whenever those services, those microservices want to communicate, they communicate through the proxy. Now, this proxy, first of all, you can inject it yourself, you can put it there yourself, or it could be automatically injected. And Kubernetes can do this for you. And I'll tell you in a minute how this is working. So if you don't want to deal with these proxies, it's very easy to get them injected automatically into every pod that you're running. And then you have the functionality in this proxy. Those proxies, they live in the same pod as the original service. So it's two containers sharing one pod. If they live in the same pod, they share the same network namespace. And this is why the proxy can do its magic and intercept the calls. So the proxy is always intercepting the calls. And that's the important part. That's like the motor of the service mesh now. And in an open source world, and that's the, the most typical implementations that we see these days, this is called Envoy. It's an open source project called Envoy, and I'll give you more details in the middle. Now, these proxies, they need to be configured, and this is what we do with the control plane. And the control plane, it's another open source project, which is called Istio. So very often we see Istio working together with Envoy, and that's the, that's the big thing that we see. So Istio is having different parts. It's steering. It's configuring the proxies, the Envoy proxies. It's also collecting telemetry data, like monitoring data from those Envoy proxies. And you can also use it to deploy certificates automatically to automatically create a uh, TLS um, connection. Just check. Now, if you have this in place, what you could do, for example, is you could have a small YAML file that looks like this. And in this YAML file, you see, I have communication going to reviews, which is the site. Now, this review site, it's addressed with HTTP. We want to talk to this host. And 80% of the requests should go to version 2, which is, uh, it's not shown the version here, but 80% go to version 2, and like 20% go to version 3. Remember when I told you we could use a service bus for this versioning or for this traffic shaping? Here, we do exactly the same thing. And it's a small YAML file, and what you do is kubectl apply minus f and this YAML file. And it's like, I took this, I wrote it myself, you don't need more. And this is how you slowly shift traffic from one version to another. And I'll give you more details why this is uh, really important. And this Istio and Envoy basically gets you into this, in this, in this world of CNCF, the Cloud Native Compute Foundation. Um, there's a number of graduated projects. One of them is Kubernetes. Another one is Prometheus. Then we have Envoy and some more. And then we have a list of incubating projects that are kind of waiting to be um, graduated. Now, this whole CNCF is like a safety net a little bit, no? It's like a safety blanket that tells you from those hundreds of open source projects that exist today, which ones are used in productions by a certain number of companies. So to get into this graduated um, category, you have to have users that use it in production. And you see Envoy is, is in this. And actually, AWS is a platinum member of the CNCF also. So we support this, and we want to grow. We want the CNCF to grow. 
Now, the service mesh, the Istio service mesh, the takeaway from Istio is it's open source. It helps you to connect, secure, and observe services. And it's actually a shift in where we put this functionality, in a shift in where we put those cross-cutting concerns or this, well, service-to-service -service communication. And the thing is, we have the control plane that is Istio, and we have the data plane that are all those Envoy proxies together. That's maybe the takeaway um, from here. And those Envoy proxies, they live in a sidecar. That's the pattern. That's the Kubernetes pattern that we apply. We want to make those proxies running in a sidecar in the same pod as the service implementation um, in Kubernetes. And this sidecar, this proxy can be injected automatically, or you can do it um, yourself if you want. So that's the open source story. And Looking more into Envoy, Envoy is a great piece of engineering. You should really, if you have time, you should read up about Envoy. There's great blog posts about it. Um, it's a level seven proxy. So level seven networking means it understands your HTTP protocol. It understands HTTP2. It understands gRPC. It even understands DynamoDB. If you talk to DynamoDB um, at Lyft, they use the Envoy proxies to get information per table, per petition, per operation, because it understands what you're talking to DynamoDB and also understands MongoDB. It's written in C++. It's eight megabyte of size. That's not a lot. Do you know how much a JDK download is these days? It's like almost 200, I guess, 160 to 200. So those eight megabyte is like 1 20th of the size. If you run, if you download one JDK, it depends on the runtime, of course, of the heap settings. But this will be a single service that runs in Java, might be up to 20 times bigger than the proxy. So for one, let's say for this, for 20 proxies, you could have one small service. So the overhead in RAM is like almost zero. It's not very, um, not very dramatic. No language, no framework dependencies, no code changes. It's production proven. So Lyft is using it like in, in thousands of applications. Uh, so they, they run it all the time. And uh, we have a customer story from Snapchat. It was presented at the summit in New York. And they also talk about using Lyft, uh, sorry, using um, NY and Istio. So it is used in production. That's very important for you to understand if this makes sense or not. And the other thing is, and that gets us more to the world of AWS, is this Istio is not tightly married or coupled um, to Envoy. They usually come together in an open source world. That's the most popular service mesh that I see these days. But you can separate them. Now, you could use just Envoy if you wanted. And um, actually, something really surprising happened last week. So last week, if you know, this Netcraft um, um, study. So Netcraft is a company that tries to find out what are the 10 most used web servers. And as you see here, it's typically Apache, which goes up and down over the years. Um, but now last week in May, um, May 2019, uh, sorry, 2019, yeah, um, Envoy appeared in this list. So the usage of Envoy increased by a factor of 500. And for the first time, this Envoy proxy appeared in this list. Now, I want to talk to you quickly explain a little bit more about why Envoy makes sense. And um, I always call these kind of projects, and I did a few of them, like crystal ball projects. So many times in my previous career, before I joined AWS, I had projects with, with big European companies. And they basically said, hey, Frank, can you help us? We want to upgrade from a version, let's say, 2 to a version 3. And we need to find out what will be the hardware requirement and the way to do it to get from version 2 to version 3. So basically, it's what you see here. That's a diagram I took from Martin Fowler, where he says, you know, this is this blue-green deployment. But to be able to deploy uh, the green version, you need to have the hardware. So if the hardware for the blue version costs you a million dollars, you need to duplicate the hardware, provide it for the green version, install the green version, test the green version, and then switch over to the green version now. Um, and that's a lot of money, that's a lot of work. And if you do this on premises, like it's super expensive. If you do this in the cloud, things get easier. In the cloud, you can just have this second set of hardware for as long as you need it, and then you pay for it as long as you use it, like 
per second exact, and then if you don't use it anymore, you return it and you stop paying for it. So that's a big benefit. And that would probably have solved all these crystal ball projects where I was asked really to spend weeks in predicting things that are not really predictable because you get some load estimates and it's super hard to say what kind of hardware you will need in one year to cover more load. Um, that's a rhetoric question I have for you. I checked the temperature for the lake here. Do you know how cold it is? Anyone? Anyone local? It's less than five degrees. It's like three to five degrees. Um, lake Ontario. Nobody likes cold water, no. It's a rhetoric question. And still, if you do this blue-green deployment, you have this big switch and you switch from blue to green. No, you put all your customers into ice cold water, like all of them. If you have 10,000, you take the switch after careful testing, I admit, but then they all run in green and they all swim in cold water if it's good or not, but you probably need a good fallback strategy. If the green version is not working as expected, you want to go back quickly to the blue version. So this switch, I think, still is not the best thing we can do. Still a lot of people talk about those blue-green deployments. So blue-green is like 100% of your customers in a big sea of cold water. Now, usually people say, if you do Kubernetes, we have those pods. If you have a service running across four different pods, you can do a rolling update. Now, remember I told you about my Raspberry Pi cluster? Even with this Raspberry Pi cluster, with Docker, I could do a rolling upgrade. And a service running across four pods, I could upgrade like the first pod, and then I was going to the second pod. So I was going from 25% to 50 to 75 to 100. And that's much smoother now. It's just not like a sea of cold water. It's just like a bathtub of cold water. Still, if you have 10,000 customers, you throw 2,500 of them into cold water, then 5,000, 7,500. It's still a lot now, but this is what you could do these days with Docker Swarm or with Kubernetes. Now the question is, couldn't it be much smoother now? Couldn't you have 1%, 2%, 3%? The answer is not if you look into these pods now, because it's like one pod or not one pod. And the thing is, you could do it with traffic shaping. If you redirect the traffic, and <coughs> excuse me, and that's what you can do with a service mesh. And that's basically what I already showed you. You already saw the YAML file that you need to apply to Istio, and then you have this traffic shifting of 20, 80%, or 3%, 97%. And that's the reason why we have those service meshes, for traffic shifting. Um, and this is where they make a lot of sense. So a lot of people say, well, I can do this with uh, Docker Swarm or Kubernetes. The answer is, yes, you can. You can do rolling upgrades, but you cannot really change this traffic flow. And for changing the traffic flow, that's not the concern of Kubernetes, no. Uh, this is why we have to service mesh on top. This is one of the reasons why we have to service mesh on top. And the other reasons is we have increased observability. And I come to this. So this could be the end of the talk. If you want to go for Istio and Envoy, you can run it today on EKS. But it is, if I have more time, nah, I have a lot of time. It is not the end of the talk. So if you want, take Istio, take Envoy. Remember those CNCF open source projects, you have all this world for you where you can play, where, what you can use in production. Um, it's amazing tools that you get, um, but there is more. So you asked us for more, basically. So I told you that a lot of our agenda is driven by customer requests. So our customers said, yeah, we understand, we, want, we see the, the appealing factor of this Istio Envoy world, but what we really want is a service mesh for all the compute services. Now, probably when I started this talk, you thought, like, why is he talking about the components that we can use for microservices? And you helped me a lot now. You said EC2, you said EKS, I, I dropped in ECS. Um, so we had different options. And the thing is, with AppMesh, we can do exactly this. We have a service mesh that is working across all the compute options that we offer. So it's ECS. It's actually also ECS with Fargate, which is a serverless way of running ECS containers, where you don't bring or provision the worker nodes. Um, you just define the resources for a container, and then you run the container. So it's a serverless way of running containers, ECS with Fargate, EKS, EC2. Actually, EC2, it doesn't even have to be in a container and um, then self-hosted or self-managed Kubernetes 
on EC2. And for all of them, we have a service mesh that is working across those compute services. Now, you probably say we spend a lot of time talking about Istio and Envoy, and that was very appealing, now, what, what I told you. And the answer is that our version is called AppMesh, and this AppMesh is using Envoy. It's using the Envoy proxy, which is the core of the, of the most popular um, service mesh that people know from open source anyway. So that's a good choice, in my opinion. And so AppMesh is based on the Envoy proxy, which is a fantastic choice because it's used a lot. No, it's, it's battle-proven. It's used in production. Um, if you want to start with AppMesh, you can do it from the AWS console that you might know. You can do it from the command line. There is an SDK for it, obviously. Good news is there is no charge. You can run it. You can explore it. There is no additional cost for you. And it supports all the third-party tools that you know from Envoy. Um, so we use Envoy, which I think is the core message. And then we build the, the, our own control plane around it because we want it to work across the different compute options. Now, a lot of people tell me, can you explain me how to get started? And to be honest, like, first of all, you have to have Kubernetes running. Then you need to get your app mesh running. And then you have to have some demo application that you want to play with. And even if you go the open source way, it's sometimes not so easy. It's well documented. We have our version well documented. So if you go to AWS documentation, you see how to get app mesh started for EC2, for ECS, for EKS. But now, since last week, actually, we have a shorter, like a shortcut that helps a lot if you just want to play with it a little bit. And that's what I want to show you here, introduce you here. So the first step is you have to have a Kubernetes cluster. And to get a Kubernetes cluster up and running, I think the easiest way is to use a open source tool. It's called EKS Control. So it's a great tool. And basically what you do is you say EKS Control, create cluster. If you want a standard Kubernetes cluster, that's all you need to do. EKS Control, create cluster. And then what it does, it picks a funny name for your cluster. So my cluster now is have, has the name like Beautiful Paintings. If you don't want the beautiful paintings name for your cluster, you specify the name. And then what you can do is you can specify app mesh access. That already um, allows app mesh to access the resources that, uh, that you want it um, to, to talk to. That makes your life much easier. So that's the single line that you need to create a, a Kubernetes cluster, assuming that you have EKS control installed. But this is really nicely documented. And this takes you a couple of minutes to install it. And then you wait until the cluster is provisioned. And then you have the Kubernetes cluster. And now, this is the shortcut that I wanted to show you. This is like the secret tip that I recommend to use if you do it for the very first time. If you don't care about details, if you don't care about IAM roles, um, if you don't care about single deployments and setting up everything. So there is something called Helm. Helm is like yum or, um, or any Linux packet manager that you might know. Um, we distribute the slides, by the way. Um, I have them on speaker deck, and AWS will send them to you. Um, so you don't have to take photos, but you're welcome to take photos. So Helm is like a package manager. And with one single Helm install, you can install the whole AWS app mesh, which brings you the Envoy proxy. And it actually brings you a lot of other sidecars that allow you to talk to other systems that some of them I already mentioned, and some of them are kind of new and different AWS um, services. So one single in installation brings you the world of AppMesh, and another single installation installs a demo application. Now, for this demo application, I want you to have a quick look here, what we do here. So we create a namespace. It's a namespace which is called AppMesh which is the namespace for the app mesh demo. And then we do something that is very Kubernetes-like now. We um, label this namespace. So it's just a tag that we put in the namespace. So we label the namespace app mesh, and we give it a label which basically says injector webhook enabled, which means the namespace is labeled with this injector webhook enabled. And basically, if app mesh is running, it will create these proxies, these sidecars for everything that is running in this, in this namespace. So this is how you turn on this um, 
proxy auto injection. If you want out how you get your proxies in the pod, that's the magic line. You have a namespace, you label the namespace. Because of the label that is detected by the app mesh, you will we will have the, the proxies injected. And then, if we have those proxies injected, we can go back to what we have already in, AW, in AWS. Um, and we can use AWS X-Ray to get more detailed information about the services that we have deployed. The service we deploy with the Helm chart is a very simple service. It's basically a load generator that you see here that is talking to Nginx. So it's very simple. Load generator talking to Nginx. You see the services. You see the invocation times. On the right-hand side here, you also see the um, distribution of the times you need to, um, to call these services with uh, the milliseconds and the, the percentages. X-ray also gives you traces. Um, so you see the, uh, an execution that looks a bit like those flame graphs. If you turn it around and color it red, it's a, it's a flame graph. Um, so you see the load generator, and you see the Nginx, and you see which part of the total execution time is, is done by which service. So that's standard AWS X-ray that you could also use for AWS Lambda if you want. So that's the integration we give you. And all of this you already have in the Helm chart that you deployed. You see response time percentiles if you're interested in this. And it also takes you to the open source world because we are also deployed Prometheus, which is the time series open source database, and Grafana. So at the same time, you have Grafana and Prometheus running. And in Grafana, you get the app mesh overview that basically tells you the, um, the top five services regarding requests and the worst five services regarding requests, um, um, regarding um, error codes, regarding HTTP 400 and 500. Um, so you have both. So for a long time, people always ask me, should we go this CNCF open source path, or should we go the AW and use the AWS services? In this little demo, we show you that you can use both now. It's up to you to, to choose. And that's what we want to do, basically. We want to give you choice, and you should pick the best one. Typically, most customers will go for the AWS services because they provide better integration, and, and we actively support them. But that's another option that you have with Grafana, and Grafana is very popular. Um, I used it myself in, in, in many projects. It's fantastic if you do load testing and you can just go back like one week in time and see what happened like one week in time regarding CPU memory, your database, your threads, whatever. So that's a, a really nice demo that I think. And um, that's the second view where you see the services like the load balancer and the Nginx. Um, if you do app mesh, I told you it's a, it's a different um, service mesh. It's not Istio. That's important to take away um, because we need to make it work across all the compute services. We have different constructs. So there's a construct that is called mesh. Then we have virtual nodes, the front end, the real service implementation. We have routers and routes. And then we have virtual services, which have virtual service names to talk to the services. So these are the constructs that you will find in the YAML files. And then you run your services, you auto-inject the proxies. And as I said, with those two Helm charts that are written by a colleague of mine, so all the credit for this goes to Paul Maddox. That's very important to mention the people that do the hard work. Um, you, can, you can play with this and see if you like Grafana more or X-Ray more. This is the, um, the console, the AWS console, where you see the virtual services, the routers, and the nodes. And the roadmap is public. Um, it's on GitHub. Super nice. If you want us to change something, you can open uh, an issue and tell us what you want to be changed. And we look at this, and this is, I already told you, this is how we prioritize the, the change requests. We have partners. Um, some of them are here. You should go and see them and visit their booth. And um, with this, I want to conclude. That's the summary. Architect wisely. That sounds like a very generic advice. But that was the first slide. Remember when I told you it's your responsibility to decide if you want to go serverless, if you want containers, ECS, EKS. Nobody else can take this away from you. So take a, a good decision make it based on facts and document it, because otherwise you will have somebody coming half a year later and questioning, questioning it again. So architect wisely, that's the most important thing. 
Um, running Kubernetes is hard. Believe me, if you don't believe me, try it yourself. If you are this super tech company that has the Kubernetes operational knowledge and enough people, you can do it. I think for most other companies, the better way to go is for a managed Kubernetes service like EKS, or if you don't want Kubernetes, you go for ECS. Um, EKS, that's the other message. It's open source Kubernetes if you want. You can use it. You can use it together with the other CNCF projects. You can have EKS with Istio and Envoy. That could be one way to go. Um, service Mesh, that was what I was trying to explain in this presentation is it extends Kubernetes. It's not something that was forgotten in Kubernetes. It's really an extra layer uh, that gives you extra quality of service um, for your network communication. It adds observability. You've seen the screenshots. I have it here running live, but we have a very spotty Wi-Fi. That's why I was not showing you live. I'm happy to show you Grafana running live or X-Ray running live um, later for a coffee. And Remember, it also works for EC2. So the service mesh is not something that you can do after you started with microservices. You can also have a service mesh first, use it to talk to your monolith, and then slowly cut out pieces from your monolith, move them to microservices, and make the service mesh basically redirect you from the monolith to the microservice implementation. So it's a way to get into microservices and it's not that you have to have microservices first and then go to the service mesh. Um, that was one of the core things we wanted to have when we provided the service mesh across different compute options. And it's free. It works across different compute options. There's no reason why you should not try today. If you're not a, a super expert in EKS and service meshes, take those two Helm charts. I'm super happy that we have them. It's not how you will install your production, but it's something that gets you up and running. You play with Grafana, you play with X-Ray, you see the differences, um, and this is how you start. With this, I want to conclude. I've done another presentation talking more about Istio and Envoy running on EKS. It was last year at the Code Conference in San Francisco. So if you want to check this, it's a little bit more details about the open source component. That was before we announced AppMesh. But it's still valid today, because some people want to stay on this open source path. Um, that's Istio and Envoy. And with this, I want to say thank you for being here. If you have any questions, I'll be around. Uh, there might be questions from Twitch, I guess. You will read them to me. So your talk was pretty popular. You were getting a lot of questions on really? Twitch. Really? Yes. Oh, it's a popular <laughs> topic, no? So first question. Would it ever be? Sorry. All right, try this again. Would it ever be possible to use the alpha version of resources in AKS in future? Sorry, I didn't get the first one. Would it ever be possible to use the alpha version of resources in EKS in the future? Which version? The alpha version of resources in EKS in the future. I don't really know what's meant with this question. I think we have to defer this and, and answer it later. OK. Uh, pleasure of humans, if you're still watching the stream, uh, feel free to add clarifying uh, details for that. Yeah. I'll move on to the next question, which is also from Pleasure of Humans. He's asking, can we add or change something to the master configuration of EKS for instance, I would like to audit API calls. Um, it depends. So basically, the backend is, you know, it's run by us. That's the whole point. Um, and there are some degrees of freedom. Um, it actually took a while for us um, to make it possible that you can auto-inject um, those proxies that we need for the service mesh. Um, and for this, we had basically had to, we had to solve the security questions you know, to allow you to do this. So it's not everything is possible that you can theoretically do in Kubernetes if, if you run it yourself. Um, but what we try to do is give you everything that you need to do um, while we are still in control of, of running the service, of running this um, managed um, backend. And then again, what I already told you um, applies. If you need something and we don't know about it, we can't implement it. 
So the roadmap is, the roadmap is public. Go to GitHub, open an issue, and explain us why, what you need and why you need it, and we carefully look into this and prioritize it. Sure. All right, next More question. Questions. Sure. Joseph Ireland, and he was really involved in your talk. Okay. He uh, has a couple of questions. First one, is there a private AWS Helm, like there's a private AWS Docker Registry, ECR? A private AWS? Uh, Docker Registry. Is there a private AWS Helm, like the private AWS Docker um, Registry? Not that I know of at the moment. Um, but again, it's um, something that um, you, can, uh, you can tell us and uh, let us know if this is important for you. So we have ECR, which is the private um, container registry. That's what he's mentioning. But uh, for Helm, I think we don't have one right now. And I think uh, there was one last question, but it was, uh, again, I'm not sure if the context will be enough. Uh, Joseph Ireland is asking if there's plans to support a hybrid solution for both on-premises and in-cloud worker nodes. Uh, that's a very difficult question. I think this is something that you should discuss with your um, solution architect. Um, it depends on the networking. It depends on many things, and it's, the question is really, what is your use case? Why are you trying um, to do this? And um, what we see a lot is that EKS is used for people that want to migrate away from on-premises, and then they, they migrate to EKS. This is why they, they want to stay on open source Kubernetes. Um, and then it depends a lot on what you're trying to achieve. Um, technically, I think it is possible. The question is if this is really what you want to do. More questions? Uh, that's the last question on Twitch. I think uh, we're think running we, out we of time also, is it? Okay, thank you again for being here. You've been a great audience. Talk to me later, I'll be around um, for a chat. Thank you. Thank you, bye.